Chapter Eleven of Wuthering Heights by Emily Bronte. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Sometimes, while meditating on these things in solitude, I've got up in a sudden terror and put on my bonnet to go see how all was at the farm. I've persuaded my conscience that it was a duty to warn him how people talked regarding his ways, and then I've recollected his confirmed bad habits, and, hopeless of benefiting him, have flinched from re-entering the dismal house, doubting if I could bear to be taken at my word. One time I passed the old gate, going out of my way on a journey to Gimmerton. It was about the period that my narrative has reached, a bright, frosty afternoon, the ground bare, and the road hard and dry. I came to a stone where the highway branches off onto the moor at your left hand, a rough sand pillar with the letters W. H. cut on its north side, on the east G., and on the south-west, T.G. It serves as a guidepost to the Grange, the heights, and the village. The sun shone yellow on its grey head, reminding me of summer, and I cannot say why, but all at once a gush of child sensations flowed into my heart. Hindley and I held it a favourite spot twenty years before. I gazed long at the weather-worn block, and, stooping down, perceived a hole near the bottom still full of snail-shells and pebbles, which we were fond of storing there with more perishable things, and, as fresh as reality, it appeared that I beheld my early playmate seated on the withered turf, his dark square head bent forward, and his little hand scooping out the earth with a piece of slate. "'Poor Hindley!' I exclaimed involuntarily. I started, my bodily eye was cheated into a momentary belief that the child lifted its face and stared straight into mine. It vanished in a twinkling, but immediately I felt an irresistible yearning to be at the heights. Superstition urged me to comply with this impulse, supposing he should be dead, I thought, or should die soon, supposing it were a sign of death. The nearer I got to the house the more agitated I grew, and on catching sight of it I trembled in every limb. The apparition had outstripped me. It stood, looking through the gate— that was my first idea on observing an elf-locked, brown-eyed boy setting his ruddy countenance against the bars. Further reflection suggested this must be Hareton, my Hareton, not altered greatly since I left him ten months since. "'God bless thee, darling!' I cried, forgetting instantaneously my foolish fears. "'Hareton, it's Nelly, Nelly, thy nurse!' He retreated out of arm's length and picked up a large flint. "'I am come to see thy father, Hareton,' I added, guessing from the action that Nelly, if she lived in his memory at all, was not recognised as one with me. He raised his missile to hurl it. I commenced a soothing speech, but could not stay his hand. The stone struck my bonnet, and then ensued from the stammering lips of the little fellow a string of curses, which, whether he comprehended them or not, were delivered with practised emphasis, and distorted his baby features into a shocking expression of malignity.' You may be certain this grieved more than angered me. Fit to cry, I took an orange from my pocket and offered it to propitiate him. He hesitated and then snatched it from my hold, as if he fancied I only intended to tempt him and disappoint him. I showed another, keeping it out of his reach. Who has taught you those fine words, my bairn? I inquired. The curate. Damn the curate and thee. Give me that, he replied. Tell us where you got your lessons, and you shall have it said I. Who's your master? Devil Daddy, was his answer. And what do you learn from Daddy? I continued. He jumped at the fruit. I raised it higher. What does he teach you? I asked. Naught, said he. But to keep out of his gate. Daddy cannot bide me because I swear at him. Ah, oh, and the devil teaches you to swear at Daddy, I observed. Aye. Nay, he drawled. Who then? Heathcliff. I asked if he liked Mr. Heathcliff. Aye, he answered again. Desiring to have his reasons for liking him, I could only gather the sentences. Ah, not. He pays Dad back what he gives to me. He curses Daddy for cursing me. He says I'm on do as I will. And the curate does not teach you to read and write, then, I pursued. No, I was told the curate should have his teeth dashed down his throat if he stepped over the threshold. Heathcliff had promised that. 
I put the orange in his hand, and bade him tell his father that a woman called Nellie Dean was wanting to speak with him by the garden gate. He went up the walk and entered the house, but instead of Hindley, Heathcliff appeared on the doorstones, and I turned directly and ran down the road as hard as ever I could race, making no halt till I gained the guidepost, and feeling as scared as if I had raised a goblin. This is not much connected with Miss Isabella's affair, except that it urged me to resolve further on mounting vigilant guard, and doing my utmost to check the spread of such bad influence at the Grange, even though I should wake a domestic storm by thwarting Mrs. Linton's pleasure. The next time Heathcliff came, my young lady chanced to be feeding some pigeons in the court. She had never spoken a word to her sister-in-law for three days, but she had likewise dropped her fretful complaining, and we found it a great comfort. Heathcliff had not the habit of bestowing a single unnecessary civility on Miss Linton, I knew. Now, as soon as he beheld her, his first precaution was to take a sweeping survey of the house-front. I was standing by the kitchen window, but I drew out of sight— He then stepped across the pavement to her, and said something. She seemed embarrassed, and desirous of getting away. To prevent it, he laid his hand on her arm. She averted her face. He apparently put some question which she had no mind to answer. There was another rapid glance at the house, and, supposing himself unseen, the scoundrel had the impudence to embrace her. "'Judas! Traitor!' I ejaculated. "'You are a hypocrite too, are you? A deliberate deceiver!' "'Who is Nellie?' said Catherine's voice at my elbow. I had been over-intent on watching the pair outside to mark her entrance. "'Your worthless friend,' I answered warmly. "'The sneaking rascal yonder. Ah, he has caught a glimpse of us. He is coming in. I wonder will he have the heart to find a plausible excuse for making love to Miss when he told you he hated her.' Mrs. Linton saw Isabella tear herself free and run into the garden, and a minute after Heathcliff opened the door— I couldn't withhold giving some loose to my indignation, but Catherine angrily insisted on silence, and threatened to order me out of the kitchen, if I dared to be so presumptuous as to put in my insolent tongue. "'To hear you, people might think you were the mistress,' she cried. "'You want setting down in your right place. Heathcliff, what are you about, raising this stir? I said you must let Isabella alone. I beg you will, unless you are tired of being received here.' and wish Linton to draw the bolts against you. "'God forbid that he should try,' answered the black villain. I detested him just then. "'God keep him meek and patient. Every day I grow madder after sending him to heaven.' "'Hush!' said Catherine, shutting the inner door. "'Don't vex me. Why have you disregarded my request? Did she come across you on purpose?' "'What is it to you?' he growled. "'I have a right to kiss her if she chooses, and you have no right to object.' "'I am not your husband. You needn't be jealous of me.' "'I'm not jealous of you,' replied the mistress. "'I'm jealous for you. Clear your face. You shan't scowl at me. If you like Isabella, you shall marry her. But do you like her? Tell the truth, Heathcliff. There, you won't answer. I'm certain you don't.' "'And would Mr. Linton approve of his sister marrying that man?' I inquired. "'Mr. Linton should approve.' returned my lady decisively. "'He might spare himself the trouble,' said Heathcliff. "'I could do as well without his approbation. And as to you, Catherine, I have a mind to speak a few words now while we are at it. I want you to be aware that I know you have treated me infernally, infernally, do you hear? And if you flatter yourself that I don't perceive it, you are a fool. And if you think I can be consoled by sweet words, you are an idiot. And if you fancy I'll suffer unrevenged, I'll convince you of the contrary in a very little while. Meantime, thank you for telling me your sister-in-law's secret. I swear I'll make the most of it, and stand you aside. What new phase of his character is this? exclaimed Mrs. Linton in amazement. I've treated you infernally, and you'll take your revenge? How will you take it, ungrateful brute? How have I treated you infernally? I seek no revenge on you replied Heathcliff less vehemently. That's not the plan. The tyrant grinds down his slaves, and they don't turn against him. They crush those beneath them. You are welcome to torture me to death for your amusement. Only allow me to amuse myself a little in the same style, and refrain from insult as much as you are able. Having leveled my palace, don't erect a hovel and complacently admire your own charity in giving me that for a home. 
if i imagined you really wished me to marry isabel i'd cut my throat oh the evil is that i am not jealous is it cried catherine well i won't repeat my offer of a wife it is as bad as offering satan a lost soul your bliss lies like his in inflicting misery you prove it edgar is restored from the ill temper he gave way to at your coming i begin to be secure and tranquil and you restless to know us at peace appear resolved on exciting a quarrel quarrel with edgar if you please heathcliff and deceive his sister you'll hit on exactly the most efficient method of revenging yourself on me the conversation ceased mrs linton sat down by the fire flushed and gloomy the spirit which served her was growing intractable she could neither lay nor control it he stood on the hearth with folded arms brooding on his evil thoughts and in this position i left them to seek the master who was wondering what kept catherine below so long ellen said he when i entered have you seen your mistress yes she's in the kitchen sir i answered she's sadly put out by mr heathcliff's behaviour and indeed i do think it's time to arrange his visits on another footing there's harm in being too soft and now it's come to this and i related the scene in the court and as near as i dared the whole subsequent dispute i fancied it could not be very prejudicial to mrs linton unless she made so afterwards by assuming the defensive for her guest edgar linton had difficulty in hearing me to the close his first words revealed that he did not clear his wife of blame this is insufferable he exclaimed it is disgraceful that she should own him for a friend and force his company on me call me two men out of the hall ellen catherine shall linger no longer to argue with the low ruffian i have humoured her enough he descended and bidding the servants wait in the passage went followed by me to the kitchen its occupants had recommenced their angry discussion mrs linton at least was scolding with renewed vigour heathcliff had moved to the window and hung his head somewhat cowed by her violent rating apparently he saw the master first and made a hasty motion that she should be silent which she obeyed abruptly on discovering the reason of his intimation how is this said linton addressing her what notion of propriety must you have to remain here after the language which has been held to you by that blackguard i suppose because it is his ordinary talk you think nothing of it you are habituated to his baseness and perhaps imagine that i can get used to it too have you been listening at the door edgar asked the mistress in a tone particularly calculated to provoke her husband implying both carelessness and contempt for his irritation heathcliff who had raised his eyes at the former speech gave a sneering laugh at the latter on purpose it seemed to draw mr linton's attention to him he succeeded but edgar did not mean to entertain him with any high flights of passion i have been so far forbearing with you sir he said quietly not that i was ignorant of your miserable degraded character but i felt you were only partly responsible for that and catherine wishing to keep up your acquaintance i acquiesced foolishly your presence is a moral poison that would contaminate the most virtuous for that cause and to prevent worse consequences i shall deny you hereafter admission into this house and give notice now that i require your instant departure three minutes delay will render it involuntary and ignominious heathcliff measured the height and breadth of the speaker with an eye full of derision cathy this lamb of yours threatens like a bull he said it is in danger of splitting its skull against my knuckles by god mr linton i am mortally sorry that you are not worth knocking down my master glanced towards the passage and signed me to fetch the men he had no intention of hazarding a personal encounter i obeyed the hint but mrs linton suspecting something followed and when i attempted to call them she pulled me back slammed the door to and locked it fair means she said in answer to her husband's look of angry surprise if you have not courage to attack him make an apology or allow yourself to be beaten it will correct you of feigning more valour than you possess no i'll swallow the key before you shall get it i'm delightfully rewarded for my kindness to each after constant indulgence of one's weak nature and the other's bad one i earn for thanks two samples of blind ingratitude stupid to absurdity edgar i was defending you and yours and i wish heathcliff may flog you sick for daring to think an evil thought of me it did not need the medium of a flogging to produce that effect on the master he tried to wrest the key from catherine's grasp and for safety she flung it to the hottest part of the fire whereupon mr edgar was taken with a nervous trembling and his countenance grew deadly pale 
For his life he could not avert that excess of emotion. Mingled anguish and humiliation overcame him completely. He leant on the back of a chair and covered his face. "'Oh, heavens! In old days this would win you knighthood!' exclaimed Mrs. Linton. "'We are vanquished! We are vanquished! Heathcliff would as soon lift a finger at you as the king would march his army against a colony of mice. Cheer up! You shan't be hurt. Your type is not a lamb. It's a sucking leveret.' "'I wish you joy of the milk-blooded coward, Cathy," said her friend. "'I compliment you on your taste, and that is the slavering, shivering thing you preferred to me. I would not strike him with my fist, but I'd kick him with my foot and experience considerable satisfaction. Is he weeping, or is he going to faint for fear?' The fellow approached and gave the chair on which Linton rested a push. He'd better have kept his distance. My master quickly sprang erect and struck him full on the throat with a blow that would have levelled a slighter man. It took his breath for a minute, and while he choked, Mr. Linton walked out by the back door into the yard, and from thence to the front entrance. "'There! You've done with coming here!' cried Catherine. "'Get away now. He'll return with a brace of pistols and half a dozen assistants. If he did overhear us, of course he'd never forgive you. You've played me an ill turn, Heathcliff. But go. Make haste.' I'd rather see Edgar at bay than you. Do you suppose I'm going with that blow burning in my gullet? He thundered. By hell no. I'll crush his ribs in like a rotten hazelnut before I cross the threshold. If I don't floor him now, I shall murder him some time. So as you value his existence, let me get at him. He is not coming, I interposed, framing a bit of a lie. There's the coachman and the two gardeners. You surely not wait to be thrust into the road by them. Each has a bludgeon, and Master Will very likely be watching from the parlour windows to see that they fulfil his orders. The gardeners and the coachman were there, but Linton was with them. They had already entered the court. Heathcliff, on the second thoughts, resolved to avoid a struggle against three underlings. He seized the poker, smashed the lock from the inner door, and made his escape as they tramped in. Mrs. Linton, who was very much excited, bade me accompany her upstairs. She did not know my share in contributing to the disturbance, and I was anxious to keep her in ignorance. "'I'm nearly distracted, Nellie,' she exclaimed, throwing herself on the sofa. "'A thousand smith's hammers are beating in my head. Tell Isabella to shun me. This uproar is owing to her, and should she or anyone else aggravate my anger at present, I shall get wild. And Nellie, say to Edgar, if you see him again tonight, that I'm in danger of being seriously ill.' I wish it may prove true. He has startled and distressed me shockingly. I want to frighten him. Besides, he might come and begin a string of abuse or complainings. I'm certain I should recriminate, and God knows where we should end. Will you do so, my good Nelly? You are aware that I am in no way blamable in this matter. What possessed him to turn listener? Heathcliff's talk was outrageous after you left us. But I could soon have diverted him from Isabella, and the rest meant nothing. Now all is dashed wrong, by the fool's craving to hear evil of self, that haunts some people like a demon. Had Edgar never gathered our conversation, he would never have been the worse for it. Really, when he opened on me in that unreasonable tone of displeasure, after I had scolded Heathcliff till I was hoarse for him, I did not care hardly what they did to each other, especially as I felt that, however the scene closed, we should all be driven asunder, for nobody knows how long. Well, if I cannot keep Heathcliff for my friend, if Edgar will be mean and jealous, I'll try to break their hearts by breaking my own. That will be a prompt way of finishing all, when I am pushed to extremity. But it's a deed to be reserved for a forlorn hope. I'd not take Linton by surprise with it. To this point he has been discreet in dreading to provoke me. You must represent the peril of quitting that policy." and remind him of my passionate temper, verging, when kindled, on frenzy. I wish you could dismiss that apathy out of that countenance, and look rather more anxious about me. The stolidity with which I received these instructions was, no doubt, rather exasperating, for they were delivered in perfect sincerity, but I believed a person who could plan the turning of her fits of passion to account beforehand might, by exerting her will, manage to control herself tolerably, even while under their influence, and I did not wish to frighten her husband, as she said, and multiply his annoyances for the purpose of serving her selfishness. Therefore I said nothing when I met the master coming towards the parlour, 
but I took the liberty of turning back to listen whether they would resume their quarrel together. He began to speak first. Remain where you are, Catherine, he said, without any anger in his voice, but with much sorrowful despondency. I shall not stay. I am neither come to wrangle nor to be reconciled, but I wish just to learn whether, after this evening's events, you intend to continue your intimacy with— Oh, for mercy's sake! interrupted the mistress, stamping her foot. For mercy's sake, let us hear no more of it now. Your cold blood cannot be worked into a fever. Your veins are full of ice water, but mine are boiling, and the sight of such chillness makes them dance. To get rid of me, answer my question, persevered Mr. Linton. You must answer it, and that violence does not alarm me. I have found that you can be as stoical as any one when you please. Will you give up Heathcliff hereafter, or will you give up me? It is impossible for you to be my friend and his at the same time, and I absolutely require to know which you choose. I require to be let alone, exclaimed Catherine furiously. I demand it. Don't you see I can scarcely stand? Edgar, you... you leave me. She rang the bell till it broke with a twang. I entered leisurely. It was enough to try the temper of a saint such senseless, wicked rages. There she lay dashing her head against the arm of the sofa and grinding her teeth so that you might fancy she would crash them to splinters. Mr. Linton stood looking at her in sudden compunction and fear. He told me to fetch some water. She had no breath for speaking. I brought a glass full, and as she would not drink I sprinkled it on her face. In a few seconds she stretched herself out stiff and turned up her eyes, while her cheeks at once blanched and livid assumed the aspect of death. Linton looked terrified. There is nothing in the world the matter, I whispered. I did not want him to yield, though I could not help being afraid in my heart. She has blood on her lips, he said, shuddering. Never mind, I answered tartly. And I told him how she had resolved, previous to his coming, on exhibiting a fit of frenzy. I incautiously gave the account aloud, and she heard me for she started up, her hair flying over her shoulders, her eyes flashing, the muscles of her neck and arms standing out preternaturally. I made up my mind for broken bones, at least, but she only glared about her for an instant, and then rushed from the room. The master directed me to follow, I did, to her chamber door. She hindered me from going further by securing it against me. As she never offered to descend to breakfast next morning, I went to ask whether she would have some carried up. No, she replied peremptorily. The same question was repeated at dinner and tea, and again on the morrow after, and received the same answer. Mr. Linton, on his part, spent his time in the library, and did not inquire concerning his wife's occupations. Isabella and he had an hour's interview, during which he tried to elicit from her some sentiment of proper horror for Heathcliff's advances, but he could make nothing of her evasive replies, and was obliged to close the examination unsatisfactorily adding, however, a solemn warning that if she were so insane as to encourage that worthless suitor, it would dissolve all bonds of relationship between herself and him. End of chapter 11